Imagine what it'd be like if we were really curious about each other. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Relational Spirituality, the weekly podcast of LargerStory.com, the podcast that sees all relationships as spiritual and all spiritual formation as relational. Now, here's your host for this week, Kep Crab. Welcome, everyone, to Relational Spirituality, the podcast brought to you by Larger Story, where you belong, you can become, and you will be known. I'm your host this week, Kep Crab. Today, I'm going to be talking with Kelly Hawkins, and I've known Kelly for about, I think it's two years now, Kelly, I'm not sure. But some, sometime shortly after dad had passed away, I think is when you and I got a chance to meet. And Kelly loves to create opportunities for others to experience God and his heart for them through her writing, her music, gardens, through conversations that matter, uh, her home, and events where she serves with Life Care Christian Center. She's also authored several books, has three grown children, and lives with her husband in Southwest Michigan. Kelly, welcome, and thanks for joining me today. How are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. You have been helping me for the last uh, several months with the next coming Larry Crab book, which is titled Off Track. And I was actually chatting with your husband uh, maybe a couple weeks ago or so. And we were talking about the book and the progress the book is making and when we're hoping to get that out, which is exciting. And we were talking about you and he was using words like thriving, words mm -hmm. like doing really well. And I said to him, I said, Dave, I've really noticed that as well. I've caught the vibe from some of our email correspondences. And even in, in your willingness to talk to me today in this podcast, Relational Spirituality says that there's something going on in you. And I would want to know what's going on and what's happening in you that seems to be making others take notice of something going on. Yeah, I would say... Uh, there's been a lot of transformation in my spirit in the last, oh boy, since last fall, really. You know, it goes back a lot further than that. But sure. but I, I wrote Warrior Woman is my seventh book and the first one in a series. Her Warrior Woman Boot Camp. There will be three volumes of this and the second one will come out this summer. But boot camp is or it was released in september last september right. of 2022 yep and i hadn't really anticipated interviews up to that point i i know god has gifted me to write so i've been focused on that and Good. I didn't really anticipate him wanting to use my weaknesses so much as where he's gifted me with strengths. But in the fall, I believe you were the first one to ask me about doing an interview. And I panicked at that point. <laughs> That's what I like to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> also, I ultimately turned you down on that interview and I recall I recall yeah <laughs> that was fine no pressure here the pressure's off <laughs> thank you and I appreciate that absolutely but I felt like I would fail if I did the interview and I felt like I would fail if I didn't I actually I didn't anticipate the second part but once I said no then I felt like I I failed so this time I figured if I do it, I'll, and fail, at least I've tried, but. Um... Kelly, thank you. Thank you for joining me today. And it's so funny as you start to unpack this. First of all, I didn't realize you wrote seven books. I've got two of them here, but we could go so many different directions with our conversation today. You and I've had conversations in the past about diets for different health ailments and all these kind of things. And I've really appreciated those because I do all these crazy recipes and crazy juicing drinks for my wife and I, who she was diagnosed with cancer three years ago, and those have been hugely helpful, but that's not what we're here to talk about today. Maybe that's another show sometime down the road for us. Um, that would be fun to chat about too, but we're here to talk about a couple of different things. But two of the books that you've written, you writ, you writ, I read this one, which is titled Feels Like I'm Drowning. And then you just referenced Warrior Woman, 
which is the beginning of a series of books that you're in the process of producing. And my mother got a chance to write the intro to, to Warrior Woman, which was really cool for me because as I read that again, it gave me just a little glimpse into my mom and what she was going through after dad had passed and how this book really did encourage her to put on that armor and different things that you talk about. And I think it still encourages her today. So those are the two books that I'm familiar with. But I'd say, Kelly, can you just briefly give us a little of your story? I know in one of the books you mentioned you had a brother that was battling cancer and some of these kind of things. And a lot. I just give us a little taste of your story. Okay. Yeah, my, my brother, it's been almost 20 years now since he passed away. Let's see. If we go, we can go back to... Let's go back to the beginning. I grew go up. Where you want to go? You go anywhere you want to go. I grew up in a family. There were three kids, three of us kids, and my mom struggled with some emotional issues and through my childhood. And I was on my own in a lot of ways. At least I felt like I was on my own, and some of that was okay because I was an introvert and I wrote songs. I learned to play guitar when I was nine. And so I wrote songs and played and my parents heard me. I was, I didn't sing publicly at all, but they would hear me in my room. And when I was in high school, my dad knew this musician he had a country band, and I grew up in the country. Everything in my background was country. So the music we listened to, country, and the songs I played and learned how to play, those were, had a country feel. and So that was comfortable to me. I love country music, girl. So my dad knew this guy who had a band and arranged for me to have an opportunity to just sing one song at one of his performances. I didn't even know how, I knew how to tune my guitar to itself, but I didn't know how to tune it. I didn't know that you were supposed to tune it to an accurate tuning method. Right, Four, 440 tuning to the E right there is what you're talking about for sure. <laughs> yeah, and it was crazy because I, here I am, I'm, learning to play songs in the key of G, but it's not really in the key of G. Right. And I don't even know what it was in. But I go to this performance, this outdoor concert, and the guy, the musician, he met with me for about two minutes before we went on. And he's like, okay, what key do you need? <laughs> I'm like, I have no idea. So he's like, how about A? Okay. I don't know. I didn't have my guitar either. So I I was very familiar with the song that we were doing. I'm very familiar with it in the way I played it. And I got up there on the stage, microphone, started the song, and the key was too high for me. But I muddled through that and... And my parents were really proud of me. And they were, even for, I mean, this was 40 years ago. So for the last 40 years, they've been just so proud of me. And they'll bring that up at times. But for me, what I heard was one guy, he was probably drunk, actually, but one guy booing. And it could have had nothing to do with me, even, but that's what I heard. And... I couldn't even talk about this actually for until just recently, but he was, I heard this booing and that was, that brought humiliation and shame that I dealt with for all these years. Do you think um, that had anything to do with your reluctance to want to do something like this today? Oh because yeah. You used the word failure. I said you earlier, you can't fail <laughs> what you're doing today. You can't fail. Even if we're in the key of A or in the key of B, which is higher than A. And, and so you can't fail. And I wonder how that has impacted you in respect to where you're moving now. 
I had another situation in high school where I was in the spotlight again. And that situation, I didn't really, <laughs> I didn't feel like I really belonged there. It was not how, well, this situation was, it was a pageant. I was encouraged by my parents to, I think they wanted to get me out of my isolation. And sure. so they helped me get involved in this Miss Teen pageant. And again, it's something that I haven't talked about in 40 years hmm. until just recently. And with this pageant, here, let me just look up my notes real quick here. With this pageant, I didn't know how to do hair and makeup, but all these other girls did. And that gave me a sense of shame. That made me feel a sense of shame. I wasn't stylish. I had hand-me-down gowns or resale shop gowns that I was wearing. And these other girls were dressed very stylishly. So again, I felt shame. I didn't see myself as a good communicator. And these other girls, they were, and more shame. I wasn't a dancer. There was a dancing part of this where the whole group, I think there were 300 girls in this, and they were, we were, oh, we had this dance routine, but it wasn't me and it brought shame. So all of that shame gave me a lack of confidence which created more shame. And I didn't, I knew I didn't fit there. But I also came to this conclusion that I didn't fit in, the, in that country place either, because that's where I thought I fit. But then there was this bullying that convinced me that I don't fit there either. So I determined from all that, that my conclusion was, if the spotlight is on me, I'm gonna be humiliated. And that humiliation will bring shame. If you told me, and in, I wanna interview you, but you're gonna be humiliated in this interview, of course I'm not gonna do it. Or if I'm just white knuckling it, then determined that I'm going to do this, but with the belief that I'm going to be humiliated, it's going to impact the way I portray myself. It's going to impact my mind, where, which is actually what happened in another interview that I told you about last fall. I did white knuckle it and enter into this interview, but I still held that conclusion that about shame and humiliation, trying to work through that. But then in that, my brain would just freeze because it, there's just too much emotion there and I can't deal with it. So that's what I was dealing with when you invited me to, to do an interview last fall. So since then, I've been on this journey to to invite God into that place and explore what's going on there. What are the deeper issues? And I know the apostle Paul said, be transformed. I think it was Paul said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I need my mind renewed here because it's believing that I'm going to be humiliated if I open my mouth, if I'm in the spotlight. And there's just too much shame in that for me to deal with. So last January, I was in Florida doing some ministry down there for a week. And at the end of the week, I had a full day that I didn't have anything to do. And I committed that whole day to, to exploring this stuff with God. And... It was a very emotional day. It was, there were a lot of tears, but it was a beautiful day as well because I took all this stuff 
from that country concert that I did and and the pageant that I did and those messages that I got from those, I took those to God and told him what I was feeling and invited him in to speak to me about this and give me clarity in my own thoughts. And what I determined was that that belief that I'll be humiliated in the spotlight was really deeper than that. It came down to a belief that the way I'm designed is unacceptable and it's wrong. I believed I was designed wrong. And that's, it was quite the accusation to God that, and realization really that I wasn't designed right. He did something wrong here in the way he designed me. My strengths don't fit in in the environment in which I live. My strengths don't fit there. And this is what I had believed. I feel like I was made for a different environment, a different world. And what I heard him in my spirit, I heard him speak to me, you were created for a different world. And I said to him, then why am I here as I am? And what I heard from him was to show the world who I am. But then that kind of stopped me in my tracks. But then the next thing really broke my heart, really. And it does make me a little emotional. But, yeah. but what I heard was because you don't trust who I created you to be, you live with a veiled presence. That's not what I intended for you. And I just had to spend quite a while just sitting with that and feeling it, exploring it, and then letting God speak into that more about how he created me and, and what he intended for me. And through the rest of that day, I just got more and more comfortable with accepting who I am as he created me to be, that I don't have to fit in someplace or be what other people are because we're all created uniquely. Yeah. But in that uniqueness, it fits his purpose. And one big example that came to mind for me was Nick Vujicic. If you're familiar with him, the man, the guy with no arms and no legs. When he was in high school, he tried to take his own life. He believed he, he was created wrong. He didn't have any arms. He didn't have any legs. And he tried to drown himself. But then God was able to get a hold of his life. And now he... He speaks to large audiences, large groups of people, and probably has more impact than almost every pastor yeah. in their congregation. He's just amazing. And to look at his example, he could easily say, I was made wrong. I don't have the body parts, the arms, the legs to serve you, God, as I think I need to serve you. And yet he's taking what God has given him and using it to bring honor and glory and tell his story and tell God's story. And I'm recognizing that he's called me to, to something unique and purposeful. And I'm not, I don't want to tell him that he's made a mistake and how he's designed me because it's for, he knows the purpose. He knows the complete purpose. And if it's in being a slow thinker sometimes, a slow processor sometimes, or just having difficulty communicating, then so be it. But like with, with Moses, I don't want to, I don't want to be the one who says, 
no, I'm not going to be willing to be used by you. I love that, Kelly. And opening my mouth. I just want to say, I think it's awesome that you're joining me today and that you've jumped off your cliff to use one of dad's <laughs> metaphors and how you're open to doing this for the glory of the Lord. That just is so beautiful. And it's interesting. We were supposed to be talking today about soul talk, which of course is, to be honest with you, I think what we're talking about as you unpack your story. And I feel like I know you a little bit better now, but it takes me back to this book that as I hear your story, the feels like I'm drowning book. I know warrior women is another piece too, but this was a very poignant and important book. I thought, cause you talk about desperate, dark times, dry bones and Ezekiel weariness, but then you shift a little bit as you progress and there's been the anchor. There's some stuff dealing with softening of the heart the gift of the journey. And I just want to read something to our listeners really quickly in your book here that uh, it's in the forward written by the gal who wrote this for you. I uh, wrote the forward and it says here real quickly, living an abundant life is about using the few short years I have here to bring glory to God and display a life of beautiful freedom as he intended for me to have. It's about living responsibly, wisely, and fully. It's about opening my hands and giving him everything I hold on to. Everything I have accomplished. Everything that's wonderful in my life. As well as everything that's painful or worrisome. And all my struggles. And after that, I can let him fill me up and then pour out everything I have in order to love him and love others fully. I just think that's really cool. Another thing you had in this book, Kelly, that kind of left a print on me is you have relational, spiritual, emotional, and physical kind of silos that you talk mm -hmm. about in that book. And it took me back to my dad years ago as he was writing the book Connecting, which my story is, and he talks about four circles. And he would say they're the personal, rational, emotional, and volitional. Those were the circles that he did. And, and I just, as I hear you start to talk about your own story, as we jump into Warrior Woman just for a second here, when you said that you felt like God didn't create you the way you were supposed to be created. And I love how you're fighting for women in this, but this book really does apply to men too. There's a lot of principles in here that I think are important, but just talk a little bit about what's going on in, in the world today and how some of that kind of stuff that's happening in regards to people fe feeling like, God, you messed up. You didn't do it right with me. I didn't have that feeling. And I'm just curious to dive into that a little bit with you, if you're willing to let me do that. All that's going on with in, in respect to warrior women, and you're talking, I think these really go well in, in regards to soul talk too. But you talked about in your story how you felt like because of shame, because of different things, you were made wrong, which I think is not correct. You were made in the image of God perfectly and how you are. And I think we see a lot of that in today's culture. In, in people saying, I, I feel like I wasn't made right, God, if even and not, maybe not saying that literally, because they're not even believing that, but just saying to themselves, I'm not made right. What, how did you move through that in a way, and you talked a little bit about it, but in a way that allows you to understand that you were made in the image of God? Okay. So the process, I talked about where Paul says to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Years ago, I became familiar with inner healing prayer. It's really just talking to God, learning to talk to God and listen to his response. But it's exploring, it's just starting with how you feel and understanding that those feelings impact your behavior. So when you, as I'm, as I'm pursuing transformation in myself, I just want to align myself with how God is thinking. So I may have this idea that I was created wrong or was designed wrong, but he's the one that knows better. And if I can align with his thinking, then I can, my mind will be transformed and I can align with his purposes for me in that. And that seems to be happening in you. Yeah. What are you doing? How is that happening? 
that's exploring what I'm feeling. Actually, I have another example that is a pretty simple example. About 12 years ago, I was stung by a bee, which doesn't sound like a big deal. I was stung a lot when I was a kid growing up in the country. It wasn't a big deal. It was painful at times, but not a big deal. But about 12 years ago, I was doing a little gardening and working in some landscaping. And I happened to reach, in, reach into the wrong spot. Didn't realize there was a nest, a wasp's nest right there and got stung. I didn't even see the bee at the time, but I certainly felt it. And I thought, oh, I hadn't been stung in years. That's, I forgot what it feels like. This isn't comfortable. I'm going to, I'll go in the house and I think I was a home, I was home alone at the time. And I went in the house and I don't remember if my kids were there at the time or not, but Dave wasn't home, my husband, and he got home right after this and <laughs> God was watching over me in that, I believe. And I, I was doing some things to wash it off, trying to make it, make sure there was no stinger in me, that kind of thing. And then I, I started getting itchy and, okay. and then I was getting more itchy. My head was itching and my whole body was starting to itch. And I said, I'm not sure what's going on here, but maybe we should go to the hospital. And just to get it checked a few minutes later, we're on our way to the hospital and it was about 10 minutes away, about Two minutes into our drive, I lost my hearing. Everything was muffled as if someone had my ears covered. And probably another 30 seconds later, I lost my vision. Everything turned white. And I told Dave, I think you should call 911. We're on our way to the hospital, but I think you should call 911. He's like, right now? Yes, right now. So he calls 911 and he's on the phone driving. He said, I think I should drive fast. Okay, good. <laughs> I could hear, but it was muffled. And the only thing I could see was white. That, that's it. But we're driving and he's on the phone with 911, hand on the steering wheel. And according to him, I pass out at that point and I fell forward. My seatbelt was on, but I fell forward in my seat and he's trying to push me back up. And there's another story I tell in one of my other books about this incident and how for the next two miles of the drive, I had this vision maybe or something, the experience where I was standing with Jesus and enveloped in his presence. And he, he was speaking into my fears and there's more to it. You can read it in the book, but, but I came out of that experience with feeling very uninhibited, but fears didn't control me for a short time after that. But anyway, I got to the hospital. And my body temperature was, <clears throat> was really low and they couldn't get a reading on that. But basically my body was shutting down to where I was dying. So fast forward to, I get out of the hospital a couple days later and let me just take a drink here. <laughs> sure. Yeah, absolutely. My throat's getting dry. Yeah. So we get out of the hospital and... Within a couple of weeks, I'm able to get myself to go out to that spot where I was stung just to see, was it really a bee? <laughs> was that really what was there? And I could see some bees flying in and out of that spot. So, okay, I know to stay away from that. And then 
over the next, I don't remember how long it was, but some time went by. And there was this fear of bees. And the next summer comes, and I'm very tentative about even being in the yard, going out. And so I didn't want to be controlled by that. So I pursued that with God. I'm like, okay, I have this fear that, and I had to explore what the fear was, that I'm going to, if I go out, if I get stung again, I'm going to die. And I had an EpiPen by then, but, yep. but still I had this belief that if I get stung, I'm going to die. So I walked through that with God and allowed him to speak into that. And he, what he spoke to me was about, it was reminding me of what he did to keep me alive when I didn't know that I would die if I got stung. So he was sovereign over that initial situation and took me through it, brought my husband home at the right time to take me to the hospital. He was, he just had it all in his control and he wasn't ready for me to die at that point. He, he kept me here and. We're grateful. <laughs> and he reminded me that he's, I don't know, I can, I'm not going to be unwise with how I, um, I'll have my EpiPen around in case I need it, or I'll do what I need to do in response, but I'm not afraid of bees anymore. Usually other people are more afraid than I am because if they know that I'm allergic, I can be in my sunroom and uh, every once in a while there will be a, a wasp in there looking for a way out. And, and even just a couple days ago, I had a friend over and I walked out there and she's, oh, there's a bee there. Be careful. And I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, let's see. I took a piece of paper and I'm trying to gently move it out. And I'm, I just don't have that fear anymore because I allowed God to speak into that, that he is sovereign over my circumstances. And Did you say this is recently? Because I know you just said even just a few months ago when you and I were talking about doing this, and you were reluctant and said, no, I don't think I'm going to. And I was fine, of course, but you changed your mind. So when did all this start to happen? The bee sting thing was, it was like 12 years ago. Okay. So that was a long time ago. But yeah, the speaking stuff is, I mean, it's always been a struggle for me. I'm always, oh boy, I can even go back to kindergarten and report cards. <laughs> I actually got a report card in kindergarten. I don't know if they still do that, but kindergarten, first grade, second grade, all my teachers would write on my report cards. Kelly's very sweet, but she doesn't talk. And they would see me playing outside and I would play normally and yell and, and talk to my friends outside. But then I got inside. And whenever I felt like the spotlight was on me, that's where I shut down. Yeah. It's interesting because I think my first grade, second grade, third grade teacher said, kept talks too much and he's not very sweet. So I don't think we had a different, <laughs> a different way there, but. I'm we can really, back I'm each really, other out. Yeah. I'm just really grateful that you were willing to do this and willing to step into this in a way. I think this is really a, just a testament to what the Holy Spirit's doing in your life. And I think it goes back to what we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, where other people, me being one of those, is seeing how the Holy Spirit is working in your life. And your husband's seeing the same thing, according to the conversation we had, like I said, a few weeks ago. And it's just, I love that because I think something's happening with me too, Kelly, and something's going on. God is on the move. It seems oftentimes that 
the world is on fire. And I get, I think it reminds me of Esther. You talk about Esther and warrior woman. And it, it reminds me of the time where the Israelites are just a little bit away from being completely destroyed and wiped off. And then God said, no, I'm coming in and I'm going to change everything. And I'm in charge here. My story is not going to be thwarted by anything that happens. And uh, I'm just really grateful that you took the time to chat with me today. And tell us real quickly, how can we get Warrior Woman? And how can we get Feels Like I'm Drowning? The other books that you've written, and maybe we can send a link out to some of the people that uh, watch too, if they're interested in getting some of those, because I of the two I've read, I would strongly recommend them. How do we get those, Kelly? They can be ordered on Amazon. That's the main place. Doing the Amazon standard stuff? Yeah. No. Just Amazon, type in. There are other Kelly Hawkins out there, but <laughs> uh, I think one's a physical therapist, but and has some books. But but mine are Warrior Woman. Feels like I'm drowning. Loved as I should have been, and safe, secure, and free. Those are the four most recent ones. Very good. So yep, all on Amazon. Kelly. Thank you so much for this time together. And uh, I, I'm really grateful that you you mustered the courage and you allowed yourself to come in here. And I want to say right away, this was no failure. <laughs> There's for sure. Well, I think you blessed yeah. me just in hearing you talk. And uh, I feel like I, I know you a little bit better now. And that's kind of part of what we're trying to do with these podcasts on relational spirituality. So folks, thanks for joining us today. Stick around next Tuesday. You'll get another podcast episode of Relational Spirituality brought to you by Larger Story. Have a great day. If you like what you heard today, hit the like button just below. Then come back by subscribing to our podcast channel. For more resources on relational spirituality, go to our website at largerstory.com.